Yes, people, Ricky here from Behind the Bars TV. So on this episode, I'm just going to be talking about the Channel 5 documentary that was on, I think it was about three or four nights ago now. But um, that was the first time I'd actually watched the documentary, the same time as a lot of you viewers were watching it. So I wasn't sure how they were going to portray me in that documentary. But I must say, um, I came across quite well. I quite enjoyed the documentary myself watching it back. Some parts I was laughing at, but one thing is for sure, everything that I said was uh, true. Even when I was talking about the bits about when I was a youngster, well, I'm saying youngster when I was 21 year old, when I went to Franklin, those were the feelings I had at the time. That's how my mind was and that's how I behaved. I didn't give a shit that I was going to Franklin I was in that mindset. Um, I wanted to go there in a fucking daft sort of way. So everything I talked about on the documentary was all facts. And um, like I see, I saw the parts when I was watching the back. So I was lying in bed with my wife. The kids were, luckily had just went to bed. So me and the wife was lying in bed watching the documentary. And because I couldn't remember some of the stuff I said, um, and when I was seeing some of the stuff about standing looking out me window and thinking, yes, I've made it, I was laughing at myself because I was thinking, like, what sort of mindset must I have been in at that age? Like, now, two things are totally different. I wouldn't fit, think like that, but that's the way I was and that's the way I've come across. But um, I was also laughing, a bit, laughing at the bit about... um. Because they edited, they edited to um, to make it sound like this. When my wife was waiting for us at the gates, when she was my girlfriend at the time, waiting for us at the gates, and the first thing I could think about was a Big Mac. <laughs> and I went and got the Big Mac, and it was that small, I ended up getting two. But yeah, I was wetting myself at that. But obviously, yeah, a lot of people that I've spoke to, the Val, uh, the Val said the same. They said they fucking had a good laugh at it. They said I came across well. So that was the main thing. I um, People enjoyed it. I didn't come across like an idiot trying to big myself up saying I've done this, I've done that in jail. Because that's not the way I want people to, to see me as because I'm not that type of person. I just say it how it is. I don't talk shit. Everything's real talk with me. Even when I talk about people that I met in Franklin, all these stories and all that. I've got no hidden agenda. I've got no motto. I say it how it is. If people don't like it, then that's their problem. I don't ever say... Apart from when I talk about the odd nonce or something on here. I don't talk about people in a bad way. I don't grief people on here. That's not what I'm about. I'm straight down the middle, tell you how it is. But um, obviously when I'm telling stories about what people have done and why they're in prison and the people that I've met, I, uh, I'm, I am mindful of the victims' families because at the end of the day, some of the things I talk about, um, if some of the families are at home watching this and they see me talking about someone that's killed one of their family members or relatives, then they're not going to be happy. That's why I don't talk about things in a bad way. I say it how it is. I, I always talk about things that's already out there in the public domain so people won't be like shocked when they see me content and think, wow, he's talking about someone that we know he shouldn't be saying these things. But... Everything that I say is in the public domain, it's on Google, it's been on the TV, so I'm not seeing anything that's never been seen, because they're, and when I'm on about like the victims' families, I'm on about people like, when I talk about the, the horrible people down the, 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 the non-swings, the likes of Levi Belfield and Huntley and all them, obviously, you've got to take a moment to think about all the victims that are involved in these crimes, and that's what I do, but um. Yeah, so when I'm talking about my time in Franklin, um, a lot of people have not, I've mentioned it before on one of my videos, but a lot of people will have seen it on that documentary when me and a few of the lads were going down to healthcare and were bumping into Huntley. I've spoken about, like I say, I've spoken about it on one or two videos. Um, and I'll just elaborate on that a little bit and tell you like what was going through my head when I seen him. When I seen Huntley, all this, it felt as if my blood just come rushing up and my temperature went up and, and I seen him and I just fucking seen red. Same as the rest of the lads that was with us 
Um, bear in mind, like I've mentioned previously, I was only 21, 22 year old at the time. Um, and that sort of crime stuck in my head, which I will have done with all you subscribers, everyone around the country. What a, um, when little Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman got took away and murdered, were not took away, got took into the house and murdered by that beast, Ian Huntley. It's had a massive effect on the whole country. It's not just the, the poor girls as families. Um, the rest of the country, it's something that sort of stayed with me, you always remember it. I don't know if you feel the same, you probably will. And um, saying something like that on the news, not all the time, saying the smug little fucking horrible creature what he was after he'd done it, speaking into the camera saying, yes, I was probably the last person to see them, knowing fine well he murdered them. And then obviously coming face to face with that evil bastard in there. Um, he's lucky that day that we didn't get our hands on him because like I say, there was four or five of us and the other lads that I was with uh, absolutely ruthless killers compared to what I was obviously I was in for what you would class in Frank and I was like a minor crime and a minor sentence even though it was a big crime and a big sentence to everybody involved including myself and um, when you get replaced like Franklin it's like because my tariff was so small, I was doing like IPP with a recommendation of four year. And then you've got people in there that's doing a recommendation of 40 years. Mine was classed as a baby sentence in Franklin, even though to me and everybody involved, it was a big sentence, which it is in Franklin. If you get what I mean, it was a baby sentence. But these are the lads that I was with. If they had gotten the hands on Huntley, it would have been game over for them because some of them were from there, uh, down London, uh, sorry, Liverpool and Manchester. And there were, like I say, ruthless killers from the streets. So uh, luckily for him that day, he managed to get behind the door on the other side when the screws opened the door for him. Because, uh, like I say, but it, it wouldn't have just, even though Huntley would have gotten a good beating, or maybe he's even something worse off the other lads that day, for all of us involved, including myself, things would have been a lot worse. I would have gotten time added onto my sentence my sentence would have been, been increased. You don't know how far it would have went. Um, I could have ended up doing a proper life sentence. But um, anyways, that's a different story. That's happened in the past, and that's where it is going to stay. Because everything that happened when I was there, that's like I say, it's in the past now. But all these stories is what I'm telling you, because I also want to bring awareness to all these young'uns going off the rails, going down the route I went down, Thinking that it's big and clever, growing up glamorizing gangsters, watching and listening to gangster rap, watching gangster movies, watching all these, uh, even the likes of that McIntyre's and stuff. I used to watch stuff like that years ago and I used to fucking love it. Um, but I'm not that type of person who's going to sit here, glorify it, glamorize crime, and do what I used to see. Because I don't want kids growing up doing the same sort of thing. Obviously, you're going to have the kids that are already like that, they're growing up like that. Um, and some of them are past saving, but I'm trying to help the ones that are on that path. And they're going to get a big shock. Like, I've spoke any of times that I've been having interviews or podcasts, and I've spoke with ex-gangsters. I don't remember Leroy Smith the other day. Sorry, I forgot to mention him. Leroy was on that documentary as well. Um, but if you go back to my previous videos... You'll see two or three videos back. I've done a podcast with Leroy. He'll sit there, tell you the same what I'm telling you now. Talk about real talk. Not glamorise it and tell you like... Some people... Yeah, you might be a ruthless fucking killer out here. Or you might be a hard nut. But as soon as you get sentenced, bang. The door shuts. You're in the jail. Door gets slammed behind you. You're sitting on that bed all by yourself. The realisation sets in. The quietness is just ringing in your ears. If you know what I mean, when you're lying on that bed on a night time, all the tellies are out, you can't get to sleep. And you can, the quietness is deafening. And you're dying to hear some noise because it's just that fucking quiet on a night time. That's when the people's not banging on the doors, gone Raj, I'm talking about in the bigger nicks, when it's quiet. And the realisation sets in, you're all by yourself. And if you can't handle that sort of environment and that atmosphere, then it's game over for you. You're going to end up swinging, cutting yourself up, just to get out of that world or end up on the drugs 
Because I've seen loads of gangsters in the prison who you wouldn't expect it. You think out here on the streets and all that, they would never touch it. You get in there and they're on the fucking smack. They're on anything, they're on spice. Lads that out here have got a massive reputation on the streets. They get in there, can't handle a jail, and they're on the spice. Um, you lads that have beaten a jail, or lasses, will know what I'm talking about. You'll have seen some faces in there that you think to yourself, these would never take drugs, but behind the door, they like that on the foil where you would never expect it because they can't handle the jail. There was one lad I was in Franklin with, a um, black lad from down Birmingham. He told us I was on an uh, ATF course with him. During the night, he never switches his TV off and he says he can't handle the quietness because of where he's come from. He's come from fucking down in the ghetto, rough neighborhoods, up in them tower block things. Um, and he says, like, he's used to being around people, being so noisy. Um, he's seen people getting killed on the streets. He's in jail for murder himself. And he's telling me he leaves his telly on during the night because he can't handle the silence. And he says sometimes if he wakes up and his telly's went off, he doesn't know whether he's dead or alive. He doesn't know if he's in a coffin or in jail. And that's why he's got his TV on, just so he can have a little bit of background noise. So he's not scared when he wakes up, he, he knows he's not dead. He knows he's fucking, he knows where he's at. But um, like these are the scenarios that's happening in prison. What these youngsters on the streets don't realize. Could be running about with guns, running about with knives, letting shots off, not giving a fuck about anybody. But then you get in there and it's a whole different story. Like Yanni B mentioned on his pod, on the, on the documentary as well. Yeah. The way he described it was bang on. He said it's a jungle. The place is a jungle. You're surrounded by killers, animals, hitmen, serial killers, fucking all sorts. Everyone all just mixed in together. And if you slip up, say the wrong thing, you're going to end up becoming a victim. You're going to end up becoming a target. And I'm on about a kill shot target. They're going to come after you and try and murder you. They're not just gonna, if you've got a bit of beef with someone, they're not just gonna come and try and batter you. They're coming to put you to sleep. And they're gonna have to put you to sleep properly. <coughs> but a little bit more that I'll talk about on here that I haven't really spoke loads about on the um, channel, which I will do a separate video on, is when, after the terrorist got hot oiled, and then the terrorist, another terrorist, hot oiled one of the lads from here, Gateshead. This is when things started kicking off seriously and things, this is when the riots started. There was a riot on G-Wing and there was a riot on F-Wing, the wing that I was on. And the riot on G-Wing was to do with, a lot to do with their Warren Slaney. Because Warren had had a fallout with another, one of the biggest gangsters in the system who's very well known, who, which is Gary Nelson. He's a black lad from down London. Um, I think he's doing a life sentence for killing a copper. Um, I'll do a podcast, not a podcast, sorry. I'll do a, um, I'll do an episode on him shortly. I'll do loads of more episodes on more people in Franklin. But getting back to the point here, Gary Nelson and Warren Slaney had a big fallout. Um, I think it was in Long Lawton where they had the first fight. I don't know the full ins and outs of that one, but I remember Warren was in Franklin, he was on G-Wing. Gary Nelson landed on my wing. And I remember they were both arguing through the fence. Because on the exercise yard, you've got G-Wing on this side, you've got F-Wing here. There's a walkway in the middle and there's two fences separating the two yards. But obviously you can see through and talk through the fence. And this day we were walking around the yard, and Gary Nelson shouting over to Warren. Warren shouting back, and they're both griefing each other. And I remember Gary Nelson shouting over to Warren, um, which antagonised Warren even more. Warren shouted over, you just got it because you got done in off a black man. And he's griefing him, and Warren's at the fence, shaking the fence, going crazy, saying, uh, I'm going to fucking kill you when I get you down the gym. And we were walking around the yard, everyone quiet as a mouse. And they got, everyone just stopped talking, just listening in, listening to what was being said backwards and forth. Um, and like I say, 
Gary Nelson ended up getting moved because of an altercation on the wing. Um, he got put down the block. Um, and then there was a bit of a riot on G-Wing. It was the Muslim lads against... Uh, I was going to say like the lads from down south, but I suppose it was all of them. It was like the, the white lads. The Muslims against the white lads. And when I'm talking about the Muslims, I'm talking about like black lads as well that have converted to Islam. And they were all... Everyone was just fighting on the wing. Warren laid a few of the lads out. And um, I'm sure a couple of people ended up getting slashed. I'm not... Obviously because I was on F-Ring, we couldn't... Didn't know what was going on properly. But um, that's what happened on that wing. It went off big style and then everyone was getting moved about. And then not long after... On our wing, one of the um, one of the scout lads got slashed off one of the Muslims, and then that caused a bit of a riot on that wing as well, on my wing as well. But on my wing, it's got like an L shape, so I was on this side, and you've got like you've got a bit on that side and a bit on this side, like the there's two different spurs. I was on this A spur, and then this was like B spur. Um, the gates got locked in the middle as soon as the alarms went off. Everyone was fucking going off it. People were getting laid out, put under the tables. The screws were fucking... One of the screws ended up getting knocked out. He was lying under the floor on the table. If I remember rightly, it was uh, someone, Murray. Yeah, I can't remember his first name, but everyone laughed home on about Murray. He got laid out, I think. And he ended up with a broken arm. On that occasion, I think he did. He was off work for a bit. But... Um, Trying to think who was involved. There was quite a few people involved in that one. And the tensions on the wing was just fucking unbearable. Everyone was just on knife edge. You were watching your backs when you're going in the shower. Because obviously there's still black lads on the wing. Still Muslims on the wing. And all the white lads are on the wing. And you're just expecting it just, just to blow at any minute. But uh, aye, that was, uh, that was what was happening at that time with the riots. It did sort of calm down after a bit. Because a lot of the ones that were involved with the riot that were sort of the troublemakers the ones that were looking for trouble they got moved um and then it sort of calmed down after that but um it never really calmed down after that it just escalated and it's still ongoing now I, um which is a which is a fucked up existence to be in because you're just watching your back constantly and like i say you're gonna get seriously hurt if you're involved in it and someone someone uh, someone wants to get you so uh, that's how that's how dangerous the cat is or and that's how much you need to watch your back when you're in there so all these youngsters young ghetto fucking boys want to watch what they're doing because when you end up in there if you get into trouble you can't handle your jail you make your mouth go if you can't handle your jail you're gonna end up killing yourself or cutting up or getting on the drugs but then if you start making your mouth go, you can't keep your mouth shut, you're going to end up getting done properly. You end up putting your, getting put on fucking protection because you can't handle your fucking jail. And that's what happens in the dispersal systems. But um, yeah, I've got plenty more to talk about, but I'll leave that one there for now because I've went on quite a bit. But if anyone who hasn't seen the documentary, I'll put the, I'll put the link in the description and let you have a look at it. But remember people... If you're liking the content, remember to like and subscribe. But enjoy the rest of your week, people. Take care.